Good day, everyone, and welcome to the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center's Fall Climate Academy's webinar on New Jersey tidal marshes and sea level rise. My name is Marjorie Kaplan, and I'm both Associate Director of the Rutgers Climate Institute, and along with my colleague, Jean Herb of the Edward Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy, I co-direct the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center. A few logistics. Today's webinar will last until 1 p.m. Other than today's presenters and our Rutgers team, you're all muted, so to communicate with us, please type your questions into the chat box. To find the chat box, look at the bottom of the screen and you'll see a little bubble that says chat. And if you click on that, you can send us questions and comments. Please send your notes to all panelists, as that ensures all of us working behind the scenes today will see your questions. Thanks to my colleagues here at Rutgers, Matt Drews and Dr. Kerry Ferraro for their help with today's webinar. We welcome your thoughts and questions. I also want to let you know we are recording today's webinar and it will be available on the New Jersey Climate Change Resource Center website, which Carrie's going to put into the chat box for you. One continuing education credit is available through the Association of State Floodplain Management, and one certification maintenance credit is available through the American Planning Association. We are very pleased to have Dr. Nicholas Procopio and Dr. Judith Weiss joining us this, today. Let me tell you a little bit about our speakers. Dr. Nicholas Procopio is a bureau chief in the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection's Division of Science and Research, where he manages the multidisciplinary research of the Bureau of Environmental Assessment. Nick co-led the development of the department's recent scientific report focused on the impacts and effects of climate change in New Jersey, which was required under Governor Murphy's Executive Order 89. Nick serves as the scientific lead for the development and expansion of policies that recognize and incorporate strategies that adapt and mitigate for the impacts associated with climate change and sea level rise. His personal expertise is in water resources management, ecology, statistical analysis, and GIS. He's an adjunct professor, professor at Drexel University as well as a local community college. Dr. Prokokibel Procopio will be followed by Dr. Judith Weiss. Dr. Weiss is a professor emerita of biological sciences at Rutgers University, Newark. She received her bachelor's degree from Cornell and her master's and PhD from NYU. Her research focuses on estuarine ecology and ecotoxicology, and she's widely published with over 200 refereed scientific papers and several books. Much of her research has been in the New York, New Jersey Harbor area, but Dr. Weiss has also done research in Indonesia and Madagascar. Among the many distinctions Dr. Weiss has achieved includes being a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, a Fulbright Senior Specialist in Indonesia, and she's the recipient of the 2016 Merit Award from the Society of Wetland Scientists. Dr. Weiss has been on numerous scientific advisory committees, and she currently chairs the Science Advisory Board of the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection. I'd like to remind everyone again to put your questions in the chat box to all panelists. And it's now my pleasure to invite Dr. Nicholas Procopio to turn on his camera and microphone and take it away. Okay. I think I'm almost there. Are we looking okay? Yes, you're great. Great, okay. Well, thank you for the opportunity to speak to everybody. Um, and it's really hard to come on after that uh, introduction for uh, Dr. Judith Weiss, right? Um, so um, I will offer you a, just a, a brief uh, overview and introduction to what the New Jersey Department of Environmental Protection is currently working on in terms of climate change. So I wanna thank Marjorie and the organizers of the uh, of this seminar for the opportunity to make everyone aware of, of what we're doing at, at DEP um, to take on head on um, um, climate change through our recent uh, science report, as well as efforts through NJ Pact. And I'll take a moment to just introduce you to NJ Pact, but let me just give you this um, crazy slide here. Um, it, it's, it's intended to simply give you a sense that DEP is immersed and strongly committed to tackling the challenges of climate change uh, from establishing a chief resilience officer who is Dave Rosenblatt, uh, who's leading our efforts uh, to collecting the science, updating rules and regulations and, and so much more in between. The, 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 what you see here is just, you know, as, as a timeline and projection of DEP's efforts in the recent past and then you know projecting into the future 
And let me just say before I talk a, a little bit about the science report uh, about NJ Pact, and it may, might make this transition a little easier. NJ Pact is our process to pre protect against climate threats. Uh, this is the department's ongoing effort to revise and update rules and regulations so that governments, businesses, residents uh, can effectively respond to current climate threats and reduce future climate damages. And so more information on NJ PAC, the process, um, the status of on our ongoing efforts can be found at the NJ PAC website, which is in the, the um, top right uh, corner of the slide, as you might see up here, NJ, nj.gov slash DEP uh, slash NJ PAC. I would encourage you to take a look there for a little bit more information on um, our efforts through changing our regulations, really growing uh, in this, this mode of, of climate change. The climate change report itself um, was released in June and can be found at the link provided on the screen, just above the uh, title there, nj.gov slash DEP slash climate change. Um, we released it in, in June, uh, and again, it was initiated under uh, Governor Murphy's Executive Order 89, which was issued in October of 2019. And so it was um, a full press effort to really pull together uh, the leading science uh, and present it in a way that regulators could use it as well as the general public to really try and focus what we know about climate change and how it's going to affect the resources within New Jersey. Um, so you can see from you know the topics outlined on this slide here, we cover greenhouse gases and climate pollutants, temperature, precipitation, sea level rise, um, ocean acidification, resources and ecosystem impacts. And then we also have an important section towards the end that highlights uh, and notes where we have research and data gaps. We don't know everything about climate change and the, the future impacts at this point. So updates to this report are scheduled uh, through the executive order on a two year rolling basis. So that'll give us an opportunity to certainly um, update and, and um, amend as we see possible. Um, I would highlight or, or, or point everybody to the key findings that are called out um, through multiple boxes throughout the report and summarized in the, the 10 page executive summary. So I always um, suggest if you're not gonna read the whole report, um, go to the, the executive summary. You'll find all of the highlights there um, and I said, we'll be updating this on a rolling two-year basis and we'll be able to, to grow this report and, and have it um, sort of a living document that reflects ongoing um, new information that we receive. So um, to tie it into and make this transition to Dr. Weiss's presentation, uh, there's a lengthy, lengthy section covering the, the tenuous nature of, of our 250,000 plus acres of tidal marsh and swamps. Uh, and how they're doing in the face of climate and rising seas. Um, so from habitat sequestration, nutrient transformation, shoreline stabilization, flood control, or just a few of the critical functions served by our, our, our coastal wetlands. So each of those functions are, are threatened as temperatures and sea levels rise. So we're likely to, lucky to have such a prolific uh, colleague as, as Dr. Judith Weiss, who's gonna speak to you in much more detail about our tidal wetlands. So let me give special acknowledgement to Dr. Weiss for her continued leadership on DEP's Science Advisory Board. And so specifically among the work of the SEB, they provided peer review of this uh, DEP's climate science report, as well as authored a, a report that Judith led, which further focused and addressed tidal marshes in, the, in New Jersey in the face of rising seas. Um, and this SAB report, is also available on, on the department's uh, SAB webpage. So uh, with that, I conclude, and I'm excited to hear what uh, Dr. Weiss has prepared for all of us. Thank you, Nick. Uh, thank you, Nick, for helping set the stage for Dr. Weiss's talk. I'd like to now invite Dr. Judith Weiss to share your screen and bring up your slides, turn on your camera and your microphone and to take it away. My share screen doesn't seem to. Hang on one second, sorry.
Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Can you all hear me? Can everybody hear me? Yeah, yes, Judy, we can hear okay. you, and you may want to put your um, your slides on presentation mode so right. they can see full screen. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Okay, uh, this is uh, going to be talking about the contents of a report that some of us from the uh, Science Advisory Board uh, gave to DEP a few months ago. Uh, my colleagues, Beth Watson, Beth Rabbit, and Charles Harmon worked with me in putting this report together. Uh, I know there are some people that don't know much about salt marshes, so I thought I'd start with a very quick run through about salt marshes or tidal marshes. They're marshes that surround an estuary, an estuary being uh, places where freshwater and salt water mix. Tidal marshes have a distinct zonation of plants. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, the low marsh, as seen here, is flooded twice a daily at high tide. So the plants here, dominated by cordgrass, Spartina alterniflora, is adapted to living half its time underwater, which is highly unusual for a grass. Uh, looking at a side view of a marsh, Here's where the water is. Here's the low marsh with the Spartina alterniflora. Behind it, there is a variety of other plant species, including another Spartina species, which is called salt hay, and then a variety of others. Now, the plants up here in the high marsh are not flooded twice daily, but they are certainly flooded during storms, and they are growing in sediment in, in, in soil that is salty. So these are all have to be salt tolerant plants. Uh, here's just a, a picture of photos of some of these plants in the high marsh. All right, functions of salt marshes, why do we care about them? They are important breeding grounds for various species of fish, shrimp, crabs, and birds. They're a stopping off place for migratory birds. They're habitat for mammals like raccoons and muskrats. And very importantly, salt marshes have extremely high productivity, supporting a lot of life. They also provide services to human beings in terms of flood control and storm surge reduction and filtering the water that comes through. They also, most importantly, for today's talk, uh, it give us coastal protection. Uh, these pictures will remind you of Hurricane Sandy uh, and, or other hurricanes. It's not to say that marshes, if you have a marsh in front of your town, you won't have any problems from a hurricane like Sandy, but they certainly reduce the wind penetration and wave strength if you have marshes in front of a, a coastal town. Uh, it has been shown that the economic damage done by Hurricane Sandy was inversely proportional to the amount of uh, salt marsh area. Now, looking at the productivity, uh, it's comparable to a rainforest or coral reef. That's amazing, isn't it? You'd never think that would have such high productivity. There are very few grazing animals that eat marsh grasses when they're alive. There are some, but it's not the sort of thing like a African savanna with, with all sorts of herbivores grazing on it. In the fall, leaves of the marsh plants die and fall onto this marsh surface, and they will then continue to decompose and turn into detritus. What's detritus? Okay, also called litter. It's dead plant material plus the microbes that are decaying the plant material. Uh, there are lots of detritus feeders in the marsh and estuary environment, various species of worms, clams, crabs, and so forth that eat this decaying plant material. And they then are eaten by larger animals. And so that the plant detritus is the base of uh, the food web in many, uh, is an important base of the food web in marshes. 
So some of the important marsh animals, quick run through, the ribbed mussel uh, shown in this picture produces these threads called byssus threads that hold the sediments together. They may attach to the roots of the Spartina and help to bind the sediments and retard erosion. Fiddler crabs, a diverse group. I'm showing some of these really beautiful ones don't live anywhere around here. The ones around here is Yucca pugilator and Yucca pugnax. Uh, and marsh crab, fiddler crab burrowing, uh, if the burrows are not too dense and crowded, can aid the growth of the Spartina by aerating the sediments. Uh, there's a variety of snails that we find in the area. Uh, boat shell that probably is familiar to a lot of you uh, is this type of snail. Uh, and so there are snails. There are two species of shrimps. There are barnacles. There are a whole variety of crabs that are living in marsh areas. Uh, note that this one is not really a horseshoe crab, is not really a crab, but since it's called a crab, I stick its picture here. Um, and these are a diverse group of both uh, hermit, two species of hermit crabs, mud crabs, marsh crabs, green crabs, and blue crabs. And some fishes. We have important fishes that are residents like the killifish mummichog here, uh, silver sides, sheep's head minnow. Uh, others that are not quite as abundant are uh, sticklebacks, flounder, pipefish, and then other larger fish will migrate through, though they're not really residents. Uh, there's one resident type of reptile, which is the diamondback terrapin. And there are enormous numbers of birds. I, mean, I can't possibly have time to go through them all, but um, marshes are a very favorite place for birders to go because there's a great, wonderful diversity of birds to be found there. So that's why we care about marshes and a little bit about what they do. Now on to the sea level rise story. Uh, we know uh, sea level is rising because of both the expansion, thermal expansion of the oceans, plus the melting of glaciers. Recently, the melting of glaciers has become a more important uh, reason than the thermal expansion. Uh, the rate of sea level rise is increasing, and the local rate in New Jersey, New York area is greater than five millimeters per year. It's not that way everywhere. New Jersey is an area because of a whole lot of things where sea level is rising faster than it's rising other places. Uh, so the question for marshes is, uh, marsh can survive if it either gets enough sediment to elevate as fast as the sea level is rising, or if it can migrate inland if there is place to go if there is open space inland to move into. Many marshes in New Jersey don't seem to get enough sediments to build up their elevation fast enough, and many marshes in the more developed northern part of the state don't have open space behind them and are subject to what is called coastal squeeze. Um, the way it will happen is that you have a marsh that's mostly marsh with some water that becomes mostly water with some marsh, which becomes open water and no marsh. That's the, uh, how, a map, how a marsh drowns. So our project for uh, our report for DEP was looking at the marshes in New Jersey. Are they elevating fast enough or migrating inland? Uh, as I said, many don't get enough sediments and many can't migrate inland because there's development right behind them. So we focused on four different uh, marsh systems uh, going from north to south, the Hackensack, the Meadowlands, uh, Raritan Bay, Barnegat Bay, and Delaware Bay. And we also looked at potential remedies to mitigate this problem. 
looking at the horizontal extents or the habitat, uh, Hackensack Meadowlands have been filled in for centuries for building towns, industrial sites, and garbage dumps. It was really a major waste for, for, for a long time uh, so that the amount of wetland habitat has, been, has decreased greatly. It's hard to know how much is being lost to sea level rise because there is still loss going on to development. And there's also a lot of restoration efforts which are increasing the acreage of wetlands. So it's really hard to evaluate what is going on with the horizontal extent of the meadowlands. In terms of other parts of the New Jersey Harbor estuary, we have um, a paucity of data here. Um, a little bit of, of study, but not much, uh, that in other parts of the New Jersey, New York, New Jersey Harbor, 4% uh, of wetlands were lost in a 10 year period. Uh, most of the loss were forested, but there are a number of 186 acres of emergent wetlands were lost to development and about 15% converted to open water. Uh, including salt marsh conversion to open water. Raritan Bay had nothing published about it at all. I was totally shocked to find that there was really nothing to say about Raritan Bay, given that Rutgers uh, is on the banks of the old Raritan and that there had been no study there. So uh, before we wanted to finish the report, I made a call to Rick Lathrop and asked them to please look and tell me what's going, going on with Raritan Bay. And I also asked Mathia Yepsen at DEP. And uh, Rick found that in the, uh, the whole of Raritan Bay, it appears to be no change in acreage. Mathia, looking at the New Jersey portion, uh, said there was more accretion than erosion going on, which is very perplexing because they're really in Raritan Bay is not a wide open. It's a pretty developed area. So we have very confusing observations here. And there's a really a need for more study of Raritan Bay area and other parts of the harbor estuary. In terms of Barnegat Bay, there's been a number of studies. I bring your attention to the arrow pointing here where we see we have a net loss of about 12% since 1972. So that's pretty uh, significant here. We also have a lot of studies on, rare t on Delaware Bay and the overall losses in Delaware Bay, if you look at the arrow here, uh, is not much. And the reason for this is that Delaware Bay is wide open behind it and there are marshes are migrating inland into the low forests behind them. Looking at the vertical changes, how are the marshes elevating relating to the rate of sea level rise? I remind you that sea level rise is over five millimeters per year now. And the way this is looked at is by surface elevation tables called SETs that evaluate both the accretion rate and the subsidence rate. So we have in the far right column, the net elevation change. And we see in the meadowlands, uh, most of the Spartina marshes are not keeping up with this. We have two Phragmites dominated marshes, low, lower salinity Phragmites marshes, that are substantially above the rate of sea level rise. Um, we look at Raritan Bay, again, no published data here either. We had a graduate student named Johnny Quispy at Rutgers who had set out, um, was looking at the accretion and uh, all of his, he had only a year and a half of data, he couldn't get a, a two-year thing because of the pandemic. So this is what he has after 18 months and everything is losing uh, in Raritan Bay. Nothing is, is gaining at all. They're all negative. 
Uh, in Barnegat Bay, we have a number of uh, studies looking at different creeks. And we see there are two creeks here that are above five, and all the rest of them are less than five. So we give a star to them, but they're certainly just being five point something is probably, you know, barely hanging in there, if at all. And we move to Delaware Bay, and we see uh, almost half of the marshes looked at in Delaware Bay are in the five or six millimeters per year range, which is again just hanging in there. Uh, nothing substantial um, in terms of not having to worry about them. I think any of all of these marshes in the five and six are still a situation we should be worrying about. Okay, so what can be done? We looked at four uh, possible things that could be done. The first is migration pathways. My marsh migration, as the Delaware Bay is doing, is, is shown in this diagram. You know, you've got your water, your marsh, and a forest behind. The water gets higher, so everything moves inland and everything is okay. And that's sort of the situation for Delaware Bay. Uh, the developed areas, uh, you know, you look at the two other pictures here, you've got houses here. Here's your marsh and you've got houses and development right here. Where is this marsh going to go? Same here. There's the marsh and here's the town. So what, what can you do in those cases? The idea is to try to protect land upland of the marshes, let people whose houses are probably flooding fairly frequently and are probably seeing marsh plants growing in their yard, may want to leave. And at the towns, this is something where uh, local towns can encourage people to sell their houses and the town can acquire private property or conservation easements, remove paved surfaces, and, and reclaim areas for the marsh to move into. This is uh, something that is done by local towns and municipalities in charge of the land use. And they have to consider issues of the populations that are living very close to the marshes. In many cases, they are not high income, they're marginalized communities, and environmental justice issues uh, can feed into what a town can do about this. So this is not necessarily easy to do this. Uh, a second possibility is fragmite, changing the way we manage Phragmites. Uh, Phragmites, common reed, uh, new genetic type, has been invading the marshes for years, and it is generally removed in uh, restoration projects and replaced with Spartina. However, Phragmites does support a lot of life. Um, some studies show fairly equal fish populations in Phragmites and Spartina tidal creeks. Other studies, many studies by my colleague Ken Abel, have found reduced fish, particularly mummy chogs, killifish, in Phragmites. Clearly, killifish don't like Phragmites. Uh, a meta analysis of these studies comes up with a conclusion there is a somewhat negative effect of Phragmites on Necton. But, you know, it's not terrible. It's not awful. It's not quite as good as Spartina. No argument there. In terms of invertebrates, most studies looking at invertebrates find that both the, the inverts that are on top on the marsh surface and invertebrates in the mud pretty much equivalent in Phragmites and Spartina marshes. A typical kind of restoration that went on for many years was using glyphosate, really horrible toxic herbicide, to kill the Phragmites, re remove the Phragmites, including the rhizomes that are below ground, which then lowers the marsh level, and then replant the Spartina. It's very labor intensive, and if any underground fragments remain, the Phragmites will come back. And then uh, if you've lowered the elevation, uh, that seems to be an anathema if you're going to want to have this marsh persist 
as the sea level is rising. Phragmites also is uh, preferable if you're concerned about coastal protection. Phragmites enables marshes to elevate faster and keep up with sea level rise better than Spartina. It builds the soils and, and also the dense tall plants are a better buffer against storm surge and winds. And this has been known for 20 years. You see, these are not, this is not news. This is 20 years. Uh, Phragmites also sequesters more nitrogen uh, and it sequesters more carbon dioxide, what we call blue carbon, as in this diagram. Carbon dioxide gets taken out of the atmosphere, goes in the plant and ends up sequestered into the soil. Uh, and so this can help mitigate climate change. So I think it would be useful if we change our management and leave some there to help the marsh survive sea level rise. Uh, third thing we can do is uh, manipulate the sediment. Uh, one thing that is, uh, in, to, is happening in New Jersey and elsewhere is uh, spraying sediments onto the marsh surface. They call this thin layer deposition. Uh, and this will bury the existing grass and the following year or the year after that, um, some plants will grow through. Uh, in some cases, they will actually plant new seeds uh, after adding this uh, sediment to the top. Um, it takes a couple of years to recover, and you can see it's not really very pretty for a while. And decisions to make is how thick to make it. Uh, and of course, the thicker you make it, the longer it will take to recover, the thinner you make it, you're going to have to do it again pretty often. You know, you, the, the issues of practicality and economics of how often you want to do this. Uh, another uh, use of dredged material uh, was done in New York City by the Corps of Engineers to uh, restore marsh islands in Jamaica Bay. Um, the red here is what the size of the islands were in 1951, and the green is how what was left of the marshes by, uh, by 2003. So you can see these marshes are all shrinking, some more than others. Uh, this one was, uh, these here were, were the most severely affected, and, and then, so instead of a marsh, uh, an island, you saw little hummocks. Uh, that, that's the sort of leftover piece of what had been a whole marsh island. So they had a beneficial reuse of dredged sand from a harbor deepening project uh, to, to try to restore the marshes to the size they were in 1974. And so they uh, did a number of these, putting the new sand on and getting the community involved in replanting the Spartina. Uh, they only intended to make low marsh. They did not make things high enough to have high marsh here. Um, and it turned out that after the initial placement, the subsidence was pretty high and they had to put additional sand on top to get the elevations that they wanted. Another thing that hasn't been done that I know of in this country, uh, but has been done in Holland, is to uh, take sediments, dredge your sediments here. You, this gets read from, from right to left. And you take the dredge sediment and put it out in the water, not on top of the marsh, but in the water in an area where currents and tides will bring it toward the marsh. So it, the idea here is that allowing natural processes to disperse the sediment onto the nearby mudflats and salt marshes, rather than dumping it on top of the marsh. And so this, as far as I know, has not been tried in the US, but it seems to me to be a really good idea. Another issue different from adding sediments is 
in cases where you have pool water pooling on the surface of the marsh, which will lead to the death of the, the grasses, the idea is to dig very thin channels. This is not like mosquito ditches, which have well known to be harmful. This is narrow, thin channels to allow the water in the ponds to drain into tidal creeks. And of course, it needs to have some slope toward the tidal creek for this to uh, be successful. Uh, and then the fourth thing we looked at was erosion at the edges, uh, living shorelines as the uh, remedy. Now, here is what an eroding edge of a marsh looks like, gets concave in here. This is due not only to sea level rise, but you have a lot of boats going through and boat wakes scouring that out. Uh, that can, can cause a similar sort of situation so that, you know, this gets undercut and then it falls off and the marsh continues to move back and you're losing the marsh at the edge. Here's a side view uh, of the, the situation. You can see that these uh, plants at the edge are going to be, chunk of marsh is going to fall off into the water. So if you put something here at the eroding edge, you may be able to salvage and prevent this erosion if you put something hard in front of it. Uh, and uh, various, you know, oyster shell bags or these coconut coral logs, things like that can be put at the eroding edge of a marsh. Uh, they call this a living shoreline that uh, to, to reduce the erosion, it turns out to be better storm protection than a marsh alone or a seawall. And uh, homeowners where such a thing is happening might be inclined to, to want to build a seawall, which is you know, extremely destructive of, of um, any kind of ecosystem, uh, any healthy marsh. Uh, seawall is, is not desired from a point of view of ecology. Looking at the coral logs, this is a Delaware Bay installation. You can see um, they put this here and they planted some, some Spartina here and here it is at the end. So it, it did a wonderful job at this location. Um, the results from this from New Jersey show that um, if you have substantial water movements, the coral logs don't last very long. So you've got to pick a place that has fairly minor uh, water movements. Then a more substantive hard kind of uh, structure you can put in front of a marsh are uh, reef balls, oysters, these is, is, for example, this is a reef ball with oyster spat on it uh, that, that can be used. Or put a bunch of these. These have been put out in uh, Raritan Bay by the baykeeper, and they seem to be doing quite well. Uh, this is a, a more complicated structure called oyster castles. Uh, and you get fouling organisms and all kinds of stuff growing there, and it's also protecting the marsh behind it. So uh, these are being done in New Jersey as well and seem to be doing pretty well. Something we haven't tried in New Jersey, but seems like a, that I know of, I should say, uh, like a good idea. Every uh, end of uh, December or early January, there are tons and tons of Christmas trees that are get discarded. And why not take them out and put them at the edge of the marsh and let them trap sediments and, and, and protect the shoreline? And this is a major program in Louisiana. Louisiana, of course, is the poster child for losing salt marshes. Um, more so than New Jersey. And so Louisiana is a, uh, a leader in finding ways to 
to restore or protect marshes. And uh, it is now a major program. It, they got the idea from the Netherlands, and it's now a major program in Louisiana, putting out Christmas trees. You've got this huge supply of biomass every, uh, every New Year's. Another thing that's uh, also, again, Louisiana, is building floating marshes. Uh, you get built structure from wood or, or PVC pipe or whatever, and you have the marsh afloat and it goes up and down with the tides. I guess the, there's, uh, you know, a limited size that you can do, but one could, could perhaps envision doing a lot of these and uh, they are being tried in Louisiana, of course. So um, I'm coming to the conclusions now. Um, New Jersey marshes are really important vital ecosystems, not only for the, uh, the habitat they provide for a whole variety of animals and, they, and, and the ecosystem services they do for coastal protection for people. And they are at, our New Jersey marshes are at great risk from sea level rise. Few are elevating fast enough and many, particularly in the northern part of the state, haven't got room for migrating inland. Uh, we found a surprisingly and disappointing lack of information on the New York, New Jersey Harbor, Raritan Bay part of the state and a lot more study is needed up there. Uh, looking at the natural solutions, that is the marsh migration pathways and the Phragmites management, this requires lots of changes in attitudes and policies, uh, meets opposition, uh, people who are, uh, you know, this is not gonna be easy, but, um, I think efforts have to be made to do these because I think if these are, are done, um, particularly the Phragmites, it's much, it, leaving Phragmites in place doesn't cost anything. Um, I was speaking to somebody who was involved as a, a consultant involved in marsh restoration and removing Phragmites and I was talking with him about the good things that Phragmites does and why is it always being removed and he said, well, I get paid to remove Phragmites, to kill Phragmites. I don't get paid to keep it in place. So um, these are the sorts of attitudes that uh, need to be changed. If we can save marshes that can't elevate fast enough and can't uh, move inland because there's stuff behind them. So these are not going to be easy. The other engineering solutions such as the adding sediments and the living shorelines are very expensive and experimental. I think we are learning more about how to do them and how, you know, what works and what doesn't work. And the fact is they're site specific. What works one place will not necessarily work another place. And these are also temporary. The sea level is going to keep rising. So um, all of this is temporary. And I would like to acknowledge all the people that gave us data. Mathia Yepsen of DEP, Leanne Hoff, Partnership for Delaware Estray, Johnny Quispy of Rutgers, Rick Lathrop, Tracy Quirk, Martha Maxwell Doyle, all of whom have been doing the measurements uh, in uh, the New Jersey marshes. Uh, and Francisco Artigas and Ildico Peckman of Mary, uh, thank them all for their data. Uh, our report is up on the DEP website. Has all of this has been, that I've said, has come from that report. And I'm done and ready for any questions and um, thank comments. You. And thank you, Judy. That was, thank you so much, Judy. That was terrific.
Um, I need to stop sharing now, right? I, that's fine. Yes, you could do that. And I'd like to um, also invite Nick uh, to join you on camera and to unmute himself. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Carrie Ferraro, who's been diligently monitoring the chat and who will direct uh, questions to our speakers. Carrie, are you there? And Nick, you want to come on? Yep, I'm here. Perfect. Thank you so much, Marjorie, and a very special thank you to you, Judy, and Nick for such wonderful presentations. Um, so we had a number of questions. Um, one was uh, whether of the, the various options that you identified um, in terms of uh, protecting the wetlands, do you have a sense of whether there are some that are more successful than others? Well, I think it's very site specific. And, uh, you know, something that works one place may not work another place. That, that's the major uh, take home message. There are lots of things ongoing in New Jersey and elsewhere. And, you know, uh, we're learning. Great. Thank you. Nick, did you have anything to add to that or? No, I mean, Judith is obviously the expert in this area, um, but you know, we're, we're uh, collaboration with Judith and has been phenomenal. And so as she learns, we learn. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, we have a number of questions uh, relating to uh, Phragmites versus Spartina. I figured. <laughs> <laughs> right. I said there meets opposition. I guess I'm about to meet the opposition here. <laughs> Um, one of the questions or kind of common theme of, of, of these questions is, um, you know, in lieu of the, in lieu of the benefits of Spartina versus, uh, excuse me, of Phragmites versus Spartina in reducing problems of sea level rise and also reducing atmospheric carbon dioxide, why not advocate to replace the Spartina with Phragmites? Well, I haven't gone that far. Um, I, I think, um, you know, the Spartina does come up as a winner, put quote unquote, in terms of habitat. Uh, it, it certainly is better for a lot more birds, which I didn't include. And uh, birds are important too. There, there are birds that love Phragmites also. But I wouldn't advocate that we, uh, you know, plant Phragmites everywhere. But I think we should leave some of it there uh, and, and figure out how to do that in such a way that the marsh can elevate and still keep all the, the better habitat functions that Spartina provides. I should mention, by the way, uh, that in China, their natural Law of species is Phragmites, and they have been invaded by Spartina. And you can read papers coming out of China that are the mirror image of papers coming out of here. I find that kind of amusing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so our next question was um, kind of like uh, regarding how you got the data. Um, Feng Wei Chen asks, what type of technology is being used to, uh, for monitoring marsh elevation? I'm guessing that kind of is site that's specific, the, but can you share some of the ways? SCT, the surface elevation tables that I'm not going to describe in great detail. It's a, it looks like a big framework of stuff. And um, I suggest they, they do Google surface elevation tables to get all the effect. What it does but is gives you not only the rate of accretion, but it gives you the subsidence going on. So that's much better than, you know, before these came up, all you could do is put out, let's say, a piece of tinfoil, you know, on, on the marsh surface and, you know, every year go and see how much new sediment has come on top of it. But uh, you won't know how much subsidence is going on. So, um, thank you. Um, 
Can you both speak a little bit to what work has been done to uh, document kind of the cost and benefit of the marshes um, and the and the various restoration techniques? Costs and benefits of the marshes. I mean, this is people have been uh, documenting benefits of marshes for a long time, and uh, you know the. There's, there's, you know, reams and reams of information about this, both in terms of fisheries, where they're, you know, they are supporting fisheries because they're the nursery grounds for some commercially important species. So you've got benefits from that. And you have also the um, human protection that, that they give to communities to protect, the, you know, they're reducing pollution. They're protecting you against storms. Uh, I mean, there was just so many years people didn't understand this and, uh, you know, just filled in marshes to most, you know, our airports, Newark Airport, Kennedy, LaGuardia, all built on what was salt marshes, filled in salt marshes. And towns, there's a lot of towns near the uh, Hackensack Meadowlands that were built on what used to be the Hackensack Meadowlands that were, I mean, people did not appreciate marshes for a long time. And it's only within the less than a century that we begin to understand how really important they are. Well, I'll get off my soapbox now. <laughs> I don't have much more to add. I think you're hearing clearly, you know, that there's, there are benefits to our salt, marsh, to our salt, mar salt marshes and the, the costs to filling them in, you know, restructuring, or draining them and so on, just it, it, it takes away from the, the natural attenuation that takes place with those. And so, um, yeah, I don't know that there's a, there's a balance between the two where you could justify um, any of the costs. Thank you both so much. Um, so there was a, a question um, from Sarah Malone that said, uh, Dr. Weiss, you noted the lack of avail available data in the Raritan estuary. Uh, could you prioritize the types of research that would benefit assessment and planning for a more resilient Raritan estuary? Well, I think we have to first get, get better data on are, are the marshes as subsiding really in the long term, as Johnny Quispy's data would indicate over an 18 month period, we need to get in there for a long, a longer term study to find out what is really going on. Because the, 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 if the horizontal data that quickly, and I thank Rick Lathrop and Mathia Yepsen for doing this for me, if in fact we're not losing marshes in the Rar in Raritan Bay, and if in fact the Maritan Bay marshes are sinking, this doesn't jive. It doesn't jive. If the marshes are sinking and not elevating at all, unless they're moving on to Route 36, I don't know where the mar what's happening. So we need to find out what's going on there. Thank you. Um, a related kind of building off of that, um, Nick, do you have, um, do you know if the state has plans to dedicate funds to the type of research uh, that Dr. Weiss has been talking about? Um, there will be a development of, a, of an integrated um, science needs throughout the department and certainly wetlands are gonna fall into that and will get prioritized. Um, but we're also within the department also always looking for uh, wetland development grants through EPA who funds much of um, a lot of the ongoing and, and long-term wetlands work that we've done. So there are a number of, of funding resources out there, um, but nothing directly dedicated at this moment. Uh, but certainly, I mean, it goes without saying that it's, 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 it's in that list of priority items where we need to know more and we need to especially fill in data gaps where uh, like the Raritan Bay and, and, you know, continue the ongoing work that's, that's, you know, um, that in the Hackensack in Delaware, 
um, Bayshore area as well. Great. And now, are these um, the the efforts to kind of restore the marshes? Is this something that's um, uh, coordinated across New Jersey and New York and Connecticut or the tri-state area, um, or are each kind of state working on their own? <laughs> I, don't, I don't. I mean, these are like individual projects that you know some group wants to do, and they get some money and does does their local marsh, uh, works on their local marsh. Um, probably more often than not, it's getting rid of Phragmites to restore the Spartina. Um. <laughs> and, and, and it will add that there, there is great collaboration between um, and a number of the, the, the coastal um, marsh groups, the, the Barney Bay Partnership, the Delaware Estuary, Hackensack, um, uh, the Meadowlands group. I mean, so there, there's a lot of folks who are working together. And, and Judith, I know you work with all of those as well. So there are targeted, you know, one-off projects, but the researchers, the knowledge is is certainly shared, you know, amongst you know all those that are collaborating. It's one of the, the the friendliest groups of scientists I've really ever worked with. Everybody seems to get along so well. Uh, I think that they, everybody recognizes the, the the greater good here, you know, and, and the value that is in the in the in the marshes and you know, a, a marsh function in the the Delaware Bay isn't, you know, completely isolated in it, in its function and needs from something that might be as far away as, you know, it, up in Raritan or it, or the Meadowlands or even, you know, up, um, you know, our coastal um, system even more, you know, so there there is a need to maintain all of these ecosystems. Great answer. Um, so our next question is from uh, Wenley Ferguson, who asked, some of the front mighties march marshes had low accretion rates. Do you know if these marshes had standing water? We had found that we can, we can install runnels into, into areas with Phragmites to reduce the impounded brackish water, which reduces the height and vigor of Phragmites while stabilizing the peat. Hmm. The Marshes that are um, the Phragmites marshes down in, in was it Barnegat or, or, um, or Delaware that were not accreting fast enough. Um, I have not personally seen them. The, the marshes that I'm familiar with more are Raritan Bay and, and the Meadowlands. So I really can't answer the question about standing water in those marshes. I don't know. But I think perhaps Mathia Yepsen or uh, Beth Watson could answer that. Great, thank you so much. Okay, so um, we had, I think we have time for, we had, that, that was our last question, right, Marjorie? That's okay. it. I'm, so, I'm sorry. <laughs> We're, we've run out of time. Um, on behalf of all of us at the New Jersey Climate Change Research Center, we'd like to once again thank you, uh, Dr. Procopio and Dr. Weiss, for your wonderful presentations and for taking time with us today. Um, we hope everyone will join us for our next Climate Academy. It'll be December 1st at noon. We'll be joined by Paul Orlando and Helene Barr, of, uh, also of DEP, but from the Division of Climate, Energy, and Radiation Protection. They'll present on the newly released 80 by 50 report, which outlines the sector by sector approach the department has identified for pathways to meet New Jersey's 2050 greenhouse gas emissions limits. Uh, that concludes today's event. Thank you all so much. You're getting rave reviews, Judy and Nick. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Bye everyone. Now.